and quasi-hyperbolic discounting. So what's all about? The key term here is discounting, discounting the future. So let me first give you some examples. All of us have to make some kind of intertemporal choice, being it smoke now or we wanna, <laughs> spend now or save for retirement, eat dessert now or be slimmer later, and finally have $100 now or $120 um, in a year. So, but how do people compare uh, costs and benefits which occur in different periods of time? Well, most people are impatient and they always prefer to have $1 today rather than $1 tomorrow, which means that um, each future dollar has a smaller equivalent present value, hence the term discounting. And um, today I'm going to talk about different rules which lead to a uh, particular form of discounting. And let's take a look at the definition first. So suppose that Alice is indifferent between uh, one door at time t and d of t doors um, today. Then we say that d of t is her discount function, right? So then uh, the discounted utility for Alice um, of the consumption stream is the sum product of the discounted uh, function multiplied by utility function. And we assume that uh, the set of outcomes in each period is the same and we also ha may have infinite time horizon. All right, and um, there are several types of discounting, actually a number which have been proposed in recent studies, but there are two main types of discounting which are the most popular. Well, the first one is exponential discounting and uh, it's predominantly used in business world. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it because it's used uh, in cost benefit analysis, in investment appraisal. And um, its key feature is that the marginal rate of substitution between two consecutive periods is always the same. It's a constant number. Um, and the second type of discounting I'm going to discuss today is quasi-hyperbolic discounting. And uh, uh, it's, uh, there is experimental evidence that quasi-hyperbolic discounting actually fits um, uh, the data better than exponential discounting. And its key feature is that the marginal rate of substitution between uh, the second and the first period is smaller than the marginal rate of substitution between the third and the second period and you know, other consecutive periods on. All right, and so we have this, suppose that we have this consumption stream and we say that discounted utility represents our preferences on the set of these consumption streams. If one consumption stream is preferred to another, if and only if, um, as it, its discounted utility has a higher value. And the question is, what type of rules, which type of axioms allow us to say that uh, the preferences of a decision maker can be um, represented by a discounted utility model with the discounting in a particular form, in the form of exponential or quasi-hyperbolic discounting? And of course, I'm not the first <laughs> person who's interested in this particular type of question. And uh, I'd like to have uh, a look at the existing axiomatization systems first without going to, into much detail for now. And uh, well, the most famous result here is Koopman's axiomatization system. And uh, recently it, have, it has been generalized um, and simplified which gave way to uh, axiomatized quasi-hyperbolic discounting as well. And uh, here we consider these preferences over consumption streams, which are non-stochastic, so we work in deterministic environment. And uh, these fundamental mathematical results, which allow us to obtain 
additive representation is um, De Bros additive utility representation theory. And uh, mathematical instruments used here, it's mainly topology. Another possible approach is um, this very setting when uh, we allow our preferences to be over lotteries. And uh, these lotteries have the whole consumption stream as an outcome. Working in that particular environment, Epstein and Hayashi axiomatize exponential and quasi-hyperbolic discounting. And again, here, in order to obtain uh, this additive representation, they used very famous theorem by von Neumann and Morgenstein. So based on that, it's possible to formulate exponential and quasi-hyperbolic discounting. Well, what's my suggestion here? It's just that we can, now we can consider again preferences and there's also some element of uh, randomness, so to say. So we consider preferences over a um, set of lotteries. So there's a lottery in each period of time. And uh, working in this environment, it, it allows us to use some known, uh, very fundamental result by Enscombe and Naumann from subjective expected utility. Uh, so it was, yes, it was mentioned in Matthew's yesterday talk. And uh, the advantage here, when we work in this very setting, um, is that when we apply these mixture axioms, it allows us to give the clear and shorter axiomatization in comparison with Hayashi, for example, where he needs to use four assumptions in order to obtain uh, the same results. So let's take a look um, into this into more de with more details. First, I need to introduce some definitions. Uh, the key definition here is that uh, each uh, set of outcomes is a mixture set. So x of, x of t is called uh, a mixture set. If for every x and y, in XT, there exists such an element which satisfies these three equations here. And uh, we say that the utility function is linear if the following equation is satisfied. And uh, now we are ready to define the mixture of two consumption streams using this very notation. Right? And um, in order to formulate Enscombe and Aumann results, it's necessary to, uh, to, he uses five assumptions on his, on the, on the preferences. Uh, but I'd like to draw your attention that uh, his results was formulated originally for the states of the world, whereas um, I changed the interpretation and look at the states of the world at, uh, like at time uh, periods rather than states of the world. So it's just, change of interpretation itself. And so um, here is some notation as well. So A is single outcomes. A single outcome A is better than B if uh, the whole consumption stream of A is greater than the consumption stream of B. So the preferences keeps four consumption streams in the very sense. So the first axiom is pretty standard. It's weak order, so the binary relation is complete and transitive. The second axiom is essentiality, which <coughs> says that uh, there are always at least two such consumption streams, that one is strictly preferred to another one. So this uh, assumption allows us uh, to avoid such a situation when our discounted utility function is just a constant. So we avoid triviality. Um, axiom three is mixture independence, and it's the most powerful axiom here, which gives us that very nice separable structure. Um, axiom four is continuity, and it's more of technical nature, I would say. And axiom five is axiom of monotonicity, which states that if we prefer one consumption stream to another like in each period of time, then overall one consumption stream is preferred to another one. So with all these 
five ingredients in place, it's possible to formulate um, this Anscombe and Naumann result um, in 1963, which states that uh, the preferences on X satisfy axioms one to five, even only if there exists a linear function, which is unique up to positive linear transformations and weights rho of t, such that uh, for area X and Y and X, for every consumption stream, the following condition uh, is satisfied, right? And now, when we have this very result, it's possible to add some theorems and to build on it and to obtain exponential discounting. So we have, we start with this, the same five axioms here, and we add uh, what we need to do is to change essentiality to essentiality of periods one and two. Um, then it's necessary to, uh, to also do it impatience, an axiom of impatience. Well, intuitively, it's quite clear what it means. So if you prefer A to B, then you will also prefer such a consumption stream where A goes first before B, rather than the other way around. <laughs> And finally, axiom number seven is axiom of stationarity, where, which is um, the strongest axiom here. It says that if you have these particular preferences uh, and uh, there's a common consumption in the first period, then if you ship both consumption streams by the same amount of time, so your preference will remain the same. And uh, with this, seven axioms, we can uh, formulate, we can easily obtain this exponential discounting form. All right, and um, speaking about quasi-hyperbolic discounting, the transition to quasi-hyperbolic discounting is not that complicated in this particular case either. So we begin again with the same set of axioms, and what we need to do is we need to generalize impatience and um, to relax stationarity to quasi-stationarity, which is effectively stationarity, but from the second period on. And uh, the important addition here is present bias axiom, which states that if we have this indifference in our preferences, and um, so the first consumption stream is impatient, whereas the second consumption stream is patient because A uh, is greater than C, whereas B is smaller than D. Then we, if we shift both consumption forward, then our choice is skewed to the um, more impatient uh, consumption stream. So these eight axioms give us the following result, the following form of discounting. Okay, so um, I'd like, I think I'd, it's time to sum, yep, sure. If, if you reversed your order on the last axiom, would you, would you axiomatize something where beta is more than one? Um, well, yeah, I think so, yeah. So as a matter of fact, uh, this present bias condition is necessary in order to state that beta belongs to this interval from zero to one, yeah. I think so. All right, so <laughs> summing up. So the key idea here is that application of Anscombe and Alman result representation theorem allows us to obtain this simple axiomatization of exponential and quasi hyperbolic discounting. And I demonstrated it to you today. But there is also one more general class of discounting, which is called semi-hyperbolic discounting. Uh, its form is like that, and it's also possible to axiomatize this with the same instruments. However, there's experimental evidence that, in fact, individual time preferences, they look more like um, generalized hyperbolic functions and um, it's not, at this very stage, it's not quite clear how to axiomatize this. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
was a hard book, this counts. You have semi, quasi, something called hyperbolic discount? Hyperbolic discounting, well, generally it means that um, it's, it's a steeper decline in comparison with exponential function. So, so that's yeah. the whole hyperbolic discounting is the whole class of discount functions. Yeah. The last line. The last line, general. yeah, is, is that's the most general form of um, hyperbolic discounting, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.